people resonate with one more than the other, but for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really it's really just that. I like both of them, but if I had to choose, Ponderosa yeah. is just fun to say. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. And hello to Andrew. Andrew's one of our newest affiliates. Welcome. And and Ken. Ken's on the call too. It's awesome to see everybody. Hey guys, just moseying around. There we go. Oh How are you? I love that you're outside. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in the Olympic National Forest, so lots lots of nature around. <laughs> awesome, man. That's great. Getting some nice sunshine down there. Yeah, yeah, we got a beautiful sunny day today, mid sixties. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Andrew, why don't you do a little introduction about what you do? And yeah. we're gonna mm. have to have Andrew on our call one day and be our guest. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't know where to start. Um, yeah, my work has grown over these years through, I, yeah, through my primary work over 2019 and 20 was breath work, um, which really led into being very vocal about, well, you know, which is what was taking place on the world with, um, with global lockdowns and mass vaccinations. And I was very, very, very vocal about that, which led me to all the, uh, epic truth warriors and truth tellers around the world who are, you know, risking their medical licenses and chiropractic offices to, yeah, really just speak the truth of what was really happening. And so, yeah, I was among the front lines of those people who were um, just sharing my truth and my wisdom of what I knew of what was happening on a planetary and, you know, universal level. And so that's kind of how my work started growing more, yeah, globally, if you will. And so, yeah, I'm, um, you know, a nutritionist, a breathwork facilitator, um, a plant medicine guide, and very, very passionate about health. So, yeah, I was put on to Pine Palm through um, uh, the brother, I can't remember his name, on the uh, who did the podcast recently on the Digital Social Hour. And I was just very drawn to the frequency of uh, this Pine Palm, and it felt very, felt very godly to me. And so I, I, um, I am going to go pick it up tomorrow, but before I start taking it, I have to go get blood tests somewhere. Cause I really want to, uh, do the blood test to, to really show people what it's going to be doing in, in my body after taking it for a couple months. So I'm really excited to, to share what you guys are doing. Cause I think it's really unique and really special. And I, and I, and, uh, yeah, I just feel really excited to share it with my audience. So so, so are you doing that, so are you doing me. your blood test to track um the testosterone levels too? Exactly. That's correct. Yes. Nice. Oh, can't wait yeah. to hear that. Yeah, totally. So the person so, that um referred you must have been Isaac. Yeah, I think it was yeah, yeah. Isaac. It was Isaac. So yeah, that's great. So great. yeah, I'm look looking forward right. to properly right. connect right. with him. And so that being said, you guys, if uh, if you can open, if or if you can answer it at the end, it's up to you. What what about pine pollen do you think do you think is so powerful for men in particular and raising the te a man's testosterone? Burgess, you want to take that? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, it's not just like that's the thing. I think it's not just for men though. I think that it's it's good for men and women both, but. As for, I think it, what it does is it it balances hormones is really what it does. So I think what it does is puts you in a state where you're optimally normally. So man or woman, it kind of regulates things. So I wouldn't say that it boosts your hormones to a way that it's like, supercharged. I just think it gets to a state where you should be when you're most healthy is really the best way to put it. Um, so I think that brings everybody back to their natural baseline of where they should be when they're most naturally healthy. And it just supports that. It supports the equilibrium in your body. It helps um, specifically um, certain areas that you might be deficient in. It helps support those areas, which in return allow you to actual function as you would in your most optimally way, like most optimally. So 
I would think that's the best way to describe it, Andrew, personally. I mean, obviously, everybody's going to have a different experience with it. Um, but I just feel like it's just, just a good way to get a base and um, just bring you back to your baseline and your most healthy self. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really good at bringing the body just back to, uh, to, back, back to homeostasis, in, exactly. in essence, for a man or a woman. Yeah, it's very grounding. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Has anyone else on the call ever done the testosterone like testing before? Well, we've had people we've worked with and people that do their own formulations. And it's the biggest, the biggest jump you're going to notice in free testosterone. So it's also good for a lot of athletes because I mean, it's not something that is going to like, we just got off the podcast talking to a bunch of like, it was one uh, chiro chiropractor, uh, two naturopath doctors, Saeed and another naturopath doctor. And um, basically going into depth about like, you know, the androgenic properties of pine pollen, the brassinoid steroids, the all the, the, you know, the whole signaling factors within your body and how it kind of really gets down to um, the specifics about how it interacts with your body in specific ways. And again, yeah, it's um, it really comes down to just bringing your body back to a place of homeostasis. And um, yeah, so. Will Saeed be joining us today? I don't think so. He didn't mention nope. he okay. would. Um, but Andrew, maybe he next week um, Saeed will be on the call and you can meet him too. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, Burgess... I'd like if, if you don't mind, I'd uh, like to just share something, Andrew and uh, Burgess, Maria. Yeah, and, please do. Uh, uh, what brought me into Canadian Pine Pollen Company was, and Pine Pollen, uh, was I was, uh, I'm 76. I was, a few years ago, taking testosterone shots a couple times a week at my naturopathic doctor's place. And I wanted to have my body producing uh, testosterone more naturally rather than being, you know, when you get injections saying, you know, your body's saying, okay, I got it. I don't need to produce it, whatever. So, uh, I started looking and I found pine pollen and I found Canadian pine pollen and the purity and the ethics and the energetics. And so I discontinued, uh, my, uh, testosterone shots and I know for a fact that my uh, uh, that I am much better off my uh, testosterone levels are good and I am just using Canadian pine pollen I'm using both yeah. logical of uh, uh, Ponderosa. I like Ponderosa because I was lived in the Ponderosa forest in northern Arizona, and also uh, I like the gold. I like the I like the powder and the tinctures, and it's uh, I know for a fact that it. Uh, I don't have to worry about having supplemental testosterone when my own body knows how to produce it. And now this is, like you say, homeostasis is a good word. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that too. And it's true. A lot of the people that are reaching out to us are in the same position. They want a natural way of getting their testosterone back to the way it was once was. And yeah, I mean, so many people, you know, that's a thing. Like a lot of the customers are repeat customers. I think for that reason, it's just, you know, it's, um, yeah, it, it works. I mean, I don't think we'd be doing what we do is still if it didn't work. If it wasn't a product that didn't benefit people, I don't think, you know, there wouldn't be a market for it. So, yeah, I appreciate you sharing that, John. That's that's awesome. I, uh, I can chime in with what John was saying. Yeah, I'm sorry. I have a little bit of uh, something's passing through me. So uh, <laughs> I apologize for my voice. Um. Yeah, so for me, it was sort of similar. I discovered Pine Pollen Company through, I think it was your Facebook ads. I read all the comments and um, uh, just really noticed that a lot of people were were very happy with uh, the energy, the increased energy, and also the uh, they were looking for 
for something that would support um, the endocrine system and, and hormones. And I took uh, the bioidentical hormones years ago. I had a fabulous practitioner who was a, uh, um, a professor at UCLA. So I would actually communicate with her over in, uh, in California. And I did that for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, my body sort of told me not to take that anymore. And I just yeah. tapered off naturally. I, I would forget and then I would feel like, I don't really want to take this today, you know? So yeah. anyways, um, so I stopped completely and then um, I wanted something that would help me to not gain weight, to not get into the menopausal symptoms and and the stories that I heard about that. And I never experienced that. I, I just uh, uh, was sliding into the pine pollen products and uh, the ponderosa is my favorite too. And when I take that in the morning, I feel an immediate burst of energy. I prefer the tincture and uh, it sort of stays with me the whole day. And um, it got me off my couch is what I like to say, call it. <laughs> and uh, I've, I didn't notice any significant weight gain. So I feel, I feel well taken care of. I don't take medical testings and anything like that really, unless I have to. So I don't have any data to share. However, I feel fantastic. So I think it's great that we have all of these wonderful testimonials to share because it's so it's just great to hear personal stories. So thanks everyone for sharing. Yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks and so how much. about, um, I'll do my little share because I know everyone's on the call and I promise, so since we're waiting for Randy, um, I wanted to show everyone, this is our largest, our bulk pine pollen bucket, which is 2.2 kilos, or no, 2.2 pounds oh, wow. and it's one kilogram. So this is the size. And it's an it's supposed to be an annual supply, but it really depends on how much you take. And this is our large bottle, so you can see the size difference. And I wish I had a third hand. <laughs> this is the 30 gram and 70 gram. So in case has anyone on the call ever ordered their one-year supply? Because there is a special offer for our affiliates. And we do sell the, the one kilo at wholesale for you. So as long as everyone know that's a benefit for being one of our affiliates. And what we really want to do is share, um, focus more on supporting our affiliates in order to share the product and the stories and their, their successes, because it's more beneficial than seeing an ad on Facebook or paying Google. So we would much rather invest in our affiliates and our community to help us share the benefits of pine pollen. So if you have any questions, I'll be on the call after. And um, also um, when we are sharing and getting the affiliate commissions, this is a great way. And Jason's on the call today. He's one of our top um, affiliates. He, the commissions really come into, like you'll see a generous payout when someone's ordering a bucket and a year's supply all at once. So I just wanted to share that because we don't really talk about the bucket as much. And when I first started working for Canadian Pine Pollen, I was like, who's going to buy a thousand dollars worth of pine pollen? <laughs> and when I could see the sales coming through, it was like, wow, people are willing to spend a thousand dollars on pine pollen. So that made me a believer. So if anyone has any questions, I'll be on, on the call at the end. And let's see, Burgess is probably checking on, I don't know where Randy is, but Burgess needs to share his stories about um, harvesting. Does anyone have any questions while we're waiting for Burgess to pop back in about the uh, one-year supply? Oh, I should also tell you about storage. So most people, I'm I'm helping general customer questions online on social media. Um, but what you want to do when you get your bucket is keep it in the freezer. Pine pollen is shelf stable. This can sit on a store shelf for two years because it is wholesale. Um, it's shelf stable for two years. If you put it in the fridge, it's good for five years. And if you put it in the freezer, it's good for eight. So the only thing that you want to do is if you have the vacuum, a way to vacuum seal, or if you have 
like some mason jars to put it in smaller jars. Once the air kind of gets, once you open the bag that's in here, you, I feel it's better if you can like reduce the amount of air surrounding the pollen. Oh. The audio is not coming through, Burgess. Okay, there we go. So that's what the product looks like inside the pail. There we go. I just got off the phone with Randy too, guys. And I mean, he's having some technical difficulties. He's trying to connect, but he's saying there's some weird issues going on. And he's pretty upset and frustrated that he can't get things going on. So I hope he connects. But I'm just going to continue on with the harvest stuff. We're going to do yeah. harvest and we'll just get going on this. So Thanks, Burgess. It would have been nice to have him join, but sorry for that, guys. But yeah. So, um, yeah, like it would have been nice to have him. This kind of tell some stories that we could have gone back and reminisce about certain things but yeah basically we're creeping up i just got um i just got a text message from one of the girls who picks with us and she sent me a little bud so um i'll bring it up here on my phone but it's fast approaching like we're getting ready for another year so um how many people do you have on your crew burgess every season it changes every year so we're starting to yeah, each year it grows. And I mean, there's some years. Our first year, what we had was um, we had a group of probably like 12 people on board. And uh, we went to different spots throughout the year. So we started in one area and we were really like our first year of harvest was it was a challenge. Like we had not that we didn't know anything about what was going on, but we we are trying to figure out how to do things and do it, you know, the most uh productive way possible so it went from picking buds like these catkins that grew on the tree and we were putting it on tarps trying to grow it like let it dry out enough to like put it in a bag and send back to Vancouver and it didn't take as long to figure out that that wasn't a very productive way of doing things because you know we just leave product to the environment so from there we got some little greenhouses and we got these greenhouses set up in another spot location that we were harvesting next and um we started drying out, but like, obviously air circulation became a thing, right? Like there's no way the humidity of these buds, once they started releasing the moisture, it was just crazy. It was like a sauna. So things weren't drying. And also things were like starting to kind of pick up um, bacteria and fungus on it. Like in a way, like you could tell, like there was, you know, there was getting some webbing, like it was growing fungus on it. So like a lot of that stuff had to got, we had to get rid of it. It was just so hot and stuff like that. So finally, we got to our third location of our harvest, and this was kind of like really high. It was called the Seeing Land Ranch. I don't know if you guys can remember that. You guys can kind of Google where that is. Now, that's about an hour and a half north of Kamloops, between Kamloops and like a place called Hunter Mile House. And um, this area was super remote, and it was high elevation. So at nighttime, it was still getting really cold. Um, during the days would warm up, but that was one of the last places we harvest just based it on the elevation and the amount of heat days. Um, but yeah, so we were picking lodgepole at that time. And by then we kind of figured out a system. What we did was we had like, you know, a couple of greenhouses set up. We had heat pumping into it in the evening that was kind of like drying it out during the day. We had kind of, um, fans running soft enough that we weren't really blowing product around and, you know, it, it finally worked out but um yeah our harvest is a new challenge each year like each year trying to figure out like a new way to do it um more effective way working with different pickers going to different parts of the countryside to try to find new areas to harvest um making relationships with new individuals that you know might have land that want us like a lot of people invite us to their property to pick you know so um I think they get intrigued by the story and, you know, we're obviously want to kind of bring some value to their property. Um, you know, we give them a percentage of whatever we pick off their property. So it's not huge money, but it's still like a little bit. And, you know, a lot of people are just interested in want to take part of it and want to help out. So like, that's really cool. It's really nice to see the sense of community within just going out to these different places and meeting people all the time. So um, yeah, you just really realize how small the world is when you get out there because 
you always find somebody, you meet somebody new and they always know somebody else that you know or somebody you've worked with in the past or, you know, the coolest thing was when we moved our harvest the second year to this location and we ended up developing a really good relationship with these people. They have a farm called Blue Sky Ranch and what they did is they're basically pig farmers and they had this piece of land there and um, they had a bunch of pine trees around their around their farm and um we pulled up we didn't know them at all and uh we said this is a crazy request but this is what we do and uh julia the lady that works there um she goes you guys don't seem like serial killers i'll tell you what you guys can put up a little greenhouse on that corner over there of our property and if you guys behave then i'll let you guys come back next year <laughs> So that's how that worked out. And uh, yeah, the next year we ended up like they had a Quonset set line that needed to be built. So we helped them build the Quonset just essentially, you know what I mean? Like we traded labor for them to be able to use the Quonset and we took over the Quonset for two months of the year. And uh, we moved our drying station into that thing. And um, basically for the rest of the year, they were using the Quonset to just keep their feed in there and whatnot. And we'd take down all our food safety stuff. And yeah, it just went from there. So she had horses. She would take us out on the countryside just to show us like trails of where all the Ponderosa was and different areas. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, so, and then, yeah, just meeting new pickers that come each year that join us on the each year's harvest. Like people come back sometimes year after year. Some people go take a year off and do something else and come back. So it's, it's always really neat, but um, yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to think of like, just, yeah. I mean, it's just such a small world. Like it's just really such a small world. Like really that's, that's what I feel when I go in the field there and just, you know, you think you're stuck in a city with a bunch of people and then you go out to the, these areas and you just realize how connected individuals are by just such a small degree of like, they say, you know, everybody in the world by seven degrees of like, you know, connection or whatnot. And it's, it's really true, especially here. I think in this area of the world, like, I think it's even less than that for sure. So um yeah and i mean i guess uh yeah do you have any other questions there maria that would help me <laughs> well, i was i was hoping for some really fascinating stories like encounting bears or like some of the the risk yeah it happens being, uh... for sure yeah i mean we haven't had any dramatic experiences with bears like you know people getting obviously chased down or whatnot but one thing is you are going to notice wildlife when you're out there. And one thing, I think all this wildlife notices you well before you notice the wildlife. That's the thing that's pretty eerie because you can be in a specific area picking and you can turn around and next thing you know, you'll, you can notice a moose that's looking at you like, you know, you know, a few kilometers away. And I've had that bears, like bears. Yeah. People like a lot of people pick with their dogs and whatnot because, and pick with radios. You know, they'll be playing music loud because a lot of thing with the bears too, they're not, they're not looking to go hunt you down. Like a lot of times the attacks are based on them being startled, right? Like you're in an area and next thing you know, they're in an area and if they have their cubs or whatever with them, then they're going to get territorial. So then it becomes an issue of them protecting themselves and their cubs. And um, it just, you know, they're going to do anything that they can to make sure that nothing's going to harm them. So a lot of times that might mean, you know, coming after you so that's the case um yeah we've ran into especially when you climb elevations when you notice you go higher or higher up in the mountains and like more remote areas like that's kind of when you start seeing more of those things so really not uncommon to see that stuff once you get to kind of like higher elevations for sure so how how has it been as far as getting the organic certification being yeah. in, working in a wild environment yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, really what organic certification just wants to kind of regulate and um, I guess kind of like guarantee that we're getting our product from an area that is still um, free of contaminants, right? So what we do is once we go to a new area, we do our own um, research to make sure that there hasn't been any like farming close to it so that there's no pesticides or whatnot getting onto the product. And then from there, we test the product once it's harvested too, to make a small batch. 
And uh, once we know that it's, you know, it's safe and it's free of anything else, we bring in an auditor to the area and then they do their own individual um, inspection of the area that we're going to be in. And then from there, it gets approved or disapproved. But we haven't been in any areas as of yet that have been disapproved. So we've been fortunate so far. We're lucky being where we are, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of areas that are just, you know, vast, vast areas of just, you know, untouched areas. So how does it, how does it work with the forest fires? How does that impact um, your harvest? Yeah, that's a good or... question. Yeah, each year, like there's areas that get compromised each year that we can't go back to year after year, but um, it's part of nature. Like, I mean, it's devastating to see that certain areas are getting burnt down and we can't go back to it. But what I can tell you is once we go back to these areas and you wait two years later, you will not see any greener vegetation than the areas that have been on forest that have been part of the forest fire. Like, it's just glowing green. Like, it's so rich in color. You can tell there's a vibrance to that soul. Like, it's part of nature's cycle in order to add nutrients to the soul and reignite the new the new the new uh the new growth of the of the forest it's just regenerative for the forest for it to happen so it's super unfortunate i feel like the reason why we're having such bad forest fires as of late is because there's an accumulation of brush and dead trees that accumulate over time and i think the natural cycle of forest fires in small scale that happen each year have been compromised i think that you know because we have so many people living in rural areas that, um, you know, that we, we, we don't allow these forest fires to naturally happen anymore. So when they do happen, they happen in a big way. So they become a lot more, um, they become a lot more dramatic. You know what I mean? They become something that is a huge thing opposed to just small things that are pretty common events year after year. So it's unfortunate. I think it's going to happen for a while and you know as as areas go prolonged without having that ability to kind of i would like to think it as a forest detoxifying in a way like that's a natural process of detoxifying you're getting rid of a lot of the dead brush you're getting rid of a lot of that stuff that's accumulating over time and you know the forest needs to breathe and the forest needs access to its soil and um over time it's just diminished where it's not getting any nutrients from the soil and it's just compounding dead brush over top of it. It needs to get cleaned up. So yeah, there's specific areas yeah, that we, we haven't been to, but we'll find new areas. Does anyone have any questions for Burgess about harvesting or sustainable their sustainable harvest practices? Go ahead, Andrea. Andrea. Yeah. Um, well, so how do the nuts and bolts work of everybody being there in within wild nature? Ah. How do you sustain yourselves? How do you stay safe? How do you have a little group? Do you have groupings of tents? Uh, do you, is anybody standing watch? <laughs> yeah, how does that works. No, great question. Yeah, that's maybe something I just take for granted because I'm involved, but um. So what we usually do is there's small towns around the areas that we do a lot of our harvest. So we we rent an Airbnb in an area that's kind of the same place we go to called Merritt each year. And it's a small town. Um, and then what we do is we have like the pickers picking in groups. Obviously, it's safe. And there's usually you find an area. It's more than one person can handle on their own. And then, yeah, the main reason is obviously safety. You don't want too many people deep in the woods by themselves for specific reasons, animals, or even you could trip and break your leg or you could fall and whatnot. Yeah. There's just so many reasons why you want to make sure that you're um, with somebody else there. So we have specific groups. They're probably about groups of about four to five. It just depends on the individual. A lot of these people know each other and um, they pick in groups together because of like, you know, they're already friends or, you know, specific areas they want to go to with another person or people just, people have vehicles that are better suited for certain areas than others. So they decide to team up and go on specific days. Um, 
But yeah, what they'll do is usually um, once you get to an area that's kind of remote, let's say if you end up in an area that's kind of an hour away from coming back to the Airbnb each night and going out, it doesn't make sense to come back and stay. So um, what you do is usually pack up for one night and you'd go out, bring your tent, you know, have enough food for you for a night or two and then go out. And then the next day you'd want to bring back your product back to um to basically myself or whoever's collecting it and weighing it and buying it, right? And that product can't stay out unattended for too long as well, right? It has to go in a cool place or else it's going to start. Like, you'll notice, we'll have to show some pictures, but um, we pick in these, they're like blueberry baskets. And that's what everybody gets. Basically, they bring the product back in, it gets weighed, and that's how you get paid. But if you put your hand in that, the berry baskets full of product, it it gives off so much heat. like. The amount of, um, the amount of like, I guess it's just like, I guess it's just, um, yeah, it's bacteria and whatnot. It's just natural, like life of the product. It's just giving off heat. It's just, it's insane. It's, it, it's, it's hard to describe on like how much heat is generated just by all those things all compacted together. But yeah, what happens is those need to get um, in an area where it's cool so that they can um, not develop too much growth of bacteria or fungus and whatnot, and then they'll stay fresh and then we'll just get them into drying racks as soon as possible. So when we, um, when I was talking about that, that farmer we met where we set up a Quonset on our property, like they'd go directly onto drying racks. And then from there, they would just start drying that evening. Right. So now we have a different system. It's, um, we bought a warehouse in Vancouver, which is the cost of, running heaters at night and the fuel costs and just sustainably like we couldn't grow anymore in the space that we were at like we just met capacity so there was no way to do that unless we had two greenhouses and that really didn't make any sense so what we do now is we pick stuff we put it into a cooler and then basically that stuff in the cooler can stay a lot longer it can stay about a week and then that roof that trailer we get hauled back to vancouver and it goes into our warehouse and then we have a bunch of dehumidifiers and whatnot set up. So basically it dries that way. So we can dry it faster. We can, it's more efficient power wise. And then once it's dried out, basically it gets bagged up into bags like these, I guess. But we got five of them bagged up. So we'll just sell those for like bulk. So like if we have a lot of companies that are interested in um, using it as an ingredient in specific things or, um, We've had customers over the wall, like a company called Daily Harvest. They were one of our first customers. And uh, yeah, they would order lots of pollen from us and we'd be sending it to them. Yeah, they um, they make, uh, I think they still do it. They have super mo- superfood smoothies and then they do a nutritional ice cream and they're using the pine pollen. Yeah, they're, they're no longer doing the ice cream. However, no, I- smoothies, yes. I used yeah. to order. I wasn't even aware that they use pine pollen. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, they did actually a video on us. It's really cool. It's called on. Um, so they do a really good job. They source all their ingredients yes. have to be premium. Yeah. So yep. they have this section on their website called the dirt. So if you look on the dirt, that's where they get all their ingredients. So they have a thing on the figs and all kinds of different things. They go visit these people, but they have one of us on the dirt on that section about the pine pollen. It's a really well done video. Like it's. You guys should check that out. Yeah, it kind of explains the nutritional benefits of pine pollen, why they use it in their products and all that kind of stuff. So, and it's actually really good aerial drone shots of like where we pick and all that kind of stuff. So maybe I'll get uh, Maria to set a link to that as well, if you don't mind at some point. I think it's in our catalog. Yeah, I think we, we have that on our website as well. So I'll find the Is link, it? And share it in the chat. Sure, yeah. So that's cool. So they run, we got companies out of Europe that are using it in kind of men's formulas. So we'll send that product in like, actually, give me one minute. I will I got a big drum here. Oh, and Burgess, if you could grab one of the buckets, the buckets that you sell, it's more like a barrel. We For commercial clients, we have this huge barrel that we sell. <laughs> okay, Andrea, I'm going to find you the um, the video. And... Um, yeah, I, but I'll be good with looking it up myself. I'm familiar with the company. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've, I've so ordered. How much, um, Burgess, how much does that sell for? I guess it's more wholesale clients that you sell that. It's basically, 
don't know if the price has changed, but it was generally 640 a kg US. So it was around six. Show, show us the bucket again because because the screen was, you were small on the screen. Was that? Do you want me to hide it? I mean, if everyone that okay. Looks good. So, so yeah, you think two big tens down. That's how we send product to those companies that are using it in that form. Yeah, other people are kind of making, we got one company out of Florida, actually. I think Andrea might have, we might have, I think I invited you to that show a couple last in the spring. Yeah, the guy that's from Florida there, his company is called Livewise. Livewise, and he makes a really nice tincture. He's been working on it for a while, and yeah, he uses the pine pollen. And actually, what we ended up doing is actually just sending him pails of finished tincture because it was a little bit easier for him instead of sending the actual raw product. So, yeah, and then yeah, so that's that's the harvest. Is like, is there anything else that I can help? Like, I guess you know, yeah, we just form small groups. We go out to specific areas. We have people pick in areas that they're familiar with. They bring it back at the end of the day. We get it weighed. We put it into a cooler. It goes back to Vancouver, goes on drying racks, and then basically it gets dried and then gets processed. So basically process is pretty easy. It just dries and it naturally releases the pollen as it would in nature, right? In nature, it has the wind to carry it away, has the sun to dry it. It's on the trees. It just, as it dries, it just slowly releases the pollen. But in our way, because they're on drying racks, they kind of dry, dry, dry. And then all, all of a sudden you got all this pollen that's on these racks. And basically you can just shake the racks. We collapse the racks usually, which means we take out these spacers and they're made out of two by fours with screen on top. We'll have to, you'll be able to see on the video too. Like our video on our website, you'll see the racks. And then basically, yeah, you can just shake those racks and you can get all the pine pollen off. And then, yeah, we have a little bit of proprietary equipment that we've developed over the years using kind of like vacuums and stuff like that to kind of like do the final step of um, separation and whatnot. So, yeah, but yeah, that's it. And then we're trying to find new ways to kind of like use a lot of the byproducts from our products. So, you know, that's why we make the soaps, obviously, is, you know, it's the byproducts of whatnot. So a lot of the husks we're figuring out right now. Um, We've extracted some of the stuff. We've made tinctures with the husks. And um, are you guys familiar with pycnogenol? Like it's an antioxidant. Yeah, comes from the tree bark. So yeah, there's high amounts of pycnogenol in those husks. So that's another like thing we'd like to work on too is make a product with that. To see, um, see if there's interest in something like that or even just add it to, you know, a tincture. I would like to make a tincture. Let me know if you guys think this is a good idea, but I'd like to do a total pine tincture, which would be the husk, the pollen, um, the needles, and then the sap. I'd like to get some of the pitch from it as well. So that would be kind of like a complete pine tincture. So uh, I don't talk about it too much because I don't want to talk about it until it's done because I don't want to have this thing over. But, you know, <laughs> but that's something I've been wanting to do for a long time. And the only thing we're really missing right now is what I'll get this year is some pitch. Like I'll go out to get some nice pine pitch. Well, there's a lot of cool benefits to all those things for different reasons. So it'll kind of be like, you know, something very uh, wide spectrum and, and beneficial for you for sure. Thanks, Burgess. Well, just being conscious of time, we'll wrap it up. Thanks for sharing. And we'll try to get Randy on so he can share about um, foraging the morels. I know. Yeah, yeah, we could do that another time. But is there any questions? Like, obviously, you know, anybody got any interesting things that I might have missed that uh, that they'd like to know about harvest for specific anything specifically? I just love your energy. I just love the that you know <laughs> that you know you you share the uh, multiple years in your as you're sharing you, you know, what you've done, how you provide, how you've uh, progressed in this, and I can just feel the good energy. Just, oh, thanks, just, John. I, I appreciate that. Sometimes I feel like I'm a little over the all over the map here, but yeah, it's just like once you start talking about it, yeah, a little new things pop up and whatnot. 
but yeah, it's enjoyable each year and it's, it's, it's always a grind each year. You know, every day you're kind of working late into the night to make sure you can get that product in a safe place and it's not going to go bad and up every morning trying to like make sure everybody's coordinated and organized and out picking in good areas and, and all that kind of stuff. So mapping out specific areas, going to specific areas that, you know, you want to make sure that um, aren't getting um, forgotten about and whatnot. So yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that, John. How about Andrea? Do you got any more questions about it? Is there anything else you're interested in to know about the harvest? Um, I was mostly interested in how that how the logistic like, yeah. logistics worked with how everybody where everybody stayed and 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 all that yeah like we're really community orientated when it comes to harvest because obviously it's hard work right like everybody needs to eat well so a lot of times too what we'll do is we'll just make a community meal every night if we can and just make sure that everybody's kind of well fed ready for the next day and gonna get a good sleep so Having that Airbnb for us is just a key in order to keep everybody as a sense of community. So everybody's in good spirits. Everybody's getting good rest, having the opportunity to get showered up and making sure they're ready for it. Because a lot of times when you're out there, a lot of people that are working in, you know, on orchards or whatnot, it's tough. Like it's, it's tough to still take care of yourself and still go out and be productive and make money during the day. And anybody would know that. Like if you're working on your own land and you're working hard all day, sometimes just finding the energy to make a meal at the end of the day and making sure that you're taken care of and ready to go the next day is always a challenge. So yeah, I mean, making sure that sense of community is always really high is always super important to keep the morale up over the or keeping the morale up over the course of the year. Because, you know, it goes fast, but really six weeks is a grind too to go heavy every day in the sun. Um, sometimes it's raining a little bit and sometimes, you know, you're you're walking a lot during the day. Like you can imagine, like it's one of those things you're preoccupied by the picking process of it. But if you're carrying around a GPS with you to track where you're going, like some people have traveled, you know, 20 kilometers on foot, you know, not even know it, you know, it's just walking around specific trees and, you know, you're trying to like go as hard as you can. Most of the people that are really successful doing it have it down to a science where they're familiar with the train that they're going on. Um, they're up every morning at a good time. And they usually pick late and um, it's not necessarily being like super fast. It's about being very knowledgeable about which trees to pick. So you want to pick trees that have like the bigger buds, the, the buds that will fall off the trees easier. Like you don't want to have to pull on them because that becomes strenuous, becomes time consuming, becomes a lot of extra effort that you don't want to do. So having a good discipline to not have to like pick everything you see and be able to understand that there's probably going to be some more trees that would be more, um, more worth your time. And then, um, yeah, also just kind of, I think, um, it's just kind of, it's a marathon, you know what I mean? It's not necessarily a sprint. It's a marathon. It's about keeping a good pace and not necessarily going hard for a short period of time it's keeping that good pace that you can maintain through the day. marathon yeah Energy. yeah so and you know what it's not often like people just need to take a couple days a day off here or there just to kind of recharge as well so having enough people having that having that magic number of people where you know, if it's not enough, you're going to have a situation where if people get tired, things are not going to, you know, you're not going to keep your quotas. But having too many people is also hard on people because then you have people that are kind of working on top of each other, which becomes a challenge as well. Right. Um, and dealing with different personalities. Once you have a bunch of people, it's like anything. It's like a workspace in any office area that you can think of. There's going to be people that get along. There's going to be people that don't get along. So it's managing that, and making sure that everybody is kind of you know, resolving any issues that might be and still being able to war work and cooperate together. But generally, everybody is very like minded and everybody's there and enjoying themselves. And, you know, if you can keep an environment that is, you know, a place where they want to be, then, you know, that's half the challenge. So where where do most of the people come from, from what 
Do they come yeah, from? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, a lot of them are French Canadian. I think, I don't know why, but the French Canadians love picking so much, but there's generally like a good number of French Canadians that come. They usually come to the orchards in the summertime. And pine pollen is kind of nice because it starts before anything else. You know, it's usually the first thing that they harvest. Um, so they can come in a little bit early. They can go spend some time. And a lot of people love picking pine pollen more than stuff in the orchards because there's all kinds of pesticides and stuff like that sprayed in the orchards, right? So yeah. they talk about like, you know, what literally a breath of, breath of fresh air picking pine pollen is, is because you can actually go out in nature. You're experiencing, you know, certain areas you've never been before. You're in the actual woods and you're actually not having to deal with like chemicals around you and whatnot. So. You know, that's that's really cool and opportunistic that the 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 pine the pine pollen pickers kind of enjoy each year. And then um yeah, I mean each year I think, you know, we have pickers that have good experiences and that's why we always have more people reaching out to us year after year wanting to kind of be involved in this is because um, you know, it's because of being able to be outside and, and whatnot. Oh my god, Randy's Randy's connected. Oh wow. <laughs> Um, one one of the things that I was going to mention is when I went out a few years ago to do some photographing of the harvest, yeah. uh, I was really surprised how everyone needs to wear these thick gloves because you could easily get poked because of all the branches, but yeah. also it's super sticky. And if you get it Snap. on your hands, it's like, it, it does not feel very good. And no, you're out there no, for hours, you can't like off. wash it off. And then the other thing is you have to be careful with your footing because you're generally working on a like an uneven, rocky, sometimes like you could easily twist your ankle or, or oh yeah. A lot of the trees that yourself you pick in the are eye kind of with the branch. Yeah. No, we've had pickers, like we had this really awesome couple that was with us. They're they're in Europe now, but she was from France, he was from Argentina, and um the poor girl, like, yeah, one year she just had a branch hit her the wrong way and she had a needle stuck in her eye. And that was crazy. She would, that's when we were at that Singing Land Ranch area I was talking about. And the closest hospital was in Kamloops, which was an hour and a half away. So we drove. And then the jerk, the jerk doctor told her she was going to lose her eye. So you can imagine how she felt about that. She was just devastated. She had a patch on her eye. She's like, so anyways, they, they gave her some antibiotics. They gave her some um, a patch on her eye. And they said, come back in two days and we'll reassess. So she was fine. And she actually talked to a new doctor. And the new doctor was pretty disgusted that the first doctor told her this. Because it really, I mean, I, I'm sure it was a possibility. But they kind of made it conclusive that, that that's what's going to happen. And it was a super bad experience. So I mean, now, I mean, you got to make sure that you're, you're, you're covering your eyes. So like, yeah, your eyes, your boots, you want to make sure you're wearing boots. And you know, one of the challenges being in the field is, is there's ticks out there too. Now, I don't think we have the ticks that we have here that we don't really like, I haven't heard of anyone getting Lyme's disease in this area. I think it's more the Eastern area of the country that has that, but I mean, you can never be too safe, right? So um, you really want to protect your head. So you want to make sure you've got a hat on. You want to make sure nothing's going to get in your hair. And then you also want to make sure nothing's going to get down your shirt. So wearing kind of like a turtleneck is always a good idea. Um, having a boots or like long leg pants so that you're not having any skin exposed that way. And yeah, again, the gloves for food safety reasons, right? Like we're, we have a food product that's going, you know, so, you know, you can imagine like you have a dirty hand and then you have an area that's already prone to kind of bacterial growth. And you're adding more bacteria to it you're just gonna kind of speed up the whole process of contamination so that's that's really big we make sure that everybody's wearing food safe gloves and that can be a challenge you can imagine picking in you know 30 degree weather celsius and having to deal with hats on and long sleeve pants and all that kind of stuff it becomes a challenge so yeah what about mosquitoes mosquitoes we're pretty lucky where we are I mean, there is mosquitoes, but I don't think it's to the same extent as what you'd have in certain areas of the country. So, I mean, you'll find a lot of mosquitoes in areas that there's stagnant water, right? Like areas where there's lakes and there's not very much running water. So, yeah. 
So, you know, that's the challenge of picking as well is just making sure that, you know, you're equipped properly, you're not going to get injured and uh, that you're just keeping yourself safe. So I understand like a lot of people get excited about picking a certain amount of product, but you know, if you're not being safe, you could pick for three days good and make good numbers, but then you'll be sitting down nursing your injury for the rest of harvest and you're not really going to be doing much for that time on. So, yeah, that's a so, good point. So the picking only happens as far as people can reach. Yeah, exactly. So think of it this way, like, yeah. And it's, and it's not like when we just started because we're, not necessarily experienced with a lot of the picking we we couldn't we didn't really understand and i mean randy can second this um but yeah like if you're out there to pick you want to obviously make you're out there to make money as well right like it's it's good to be in nature and enjoy that but also you're not going to do it if it's charity work so you can imagine bringing a ladder around with you and trying to climb a tree is not very productive. Like there's no way you could climb as much as you could for somebody that's just going and picking. Like that's the expression, the low hanging fruit, right? Like it's, you want to pick the low hanging fruit because it's, it's the most efficient way to fill up that basket fast. If you're, um, if you're going and trying to climb a tree and you see some nice buds on top, but it takes you twice as long to get at those buds before you can pick them it's not very effective. It's not. So, you know, in my early days, like I would go to areas that people picked before and I'd be like, are you sure that you guys pick? There's so much here still. But like, once you understand it and you realize that, like, like I was telling you before is understanding what to pick and, and, um, which trees are worth picking you, you looking at it from a different perspective. And for us too, that's really good because from a sustainability sustainability issue or perspective of things, you don't want things like you don't want to totally cream a tree and have nothing left for the environment or for that tree to thrive. So you're picking such a small amount from each tree. It's really unnoticeable. And this is like when I talk about pine pollen to anybody, like I've probably said this a million times before, but the way to resonate pine pollen as why it's healthy for you is because in nature it's created in abundance like think about it how much is created in nature each spring there's there's way more than what you need to actually germinate a tree with right like you're you got so much pine pollen there's tons of it that happened throughout the year in the forest that happened during the pollination season and the reason that is is because it's used as nature as a fertilizer each spring it's used by the insects as a food to promote the growing season so you think about it, it's mother nature superfood is really what it is. So created an abundance like that, um, it's it's created for nature in order to kind of promote each year's growing spree, um, growing season. And it's basically, that's why it's healthy for us as well. Like think about it as mother nature superfood. That's obviously beneficial for us as well. It's a sustainable natural resource that we would be really neglect in not using it. Yeah. This is Randy, guys. Hey, guys. Sorry it took me so long. I was following the wrong link. You see that the link got updated? I'm sorry about that. It was my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> All good. Yeah, yeah can, Randy. Can, I'd like to talk about the uh, ticks, Burgess, because yeah, yeah. I've had Lyme's disease twice. And it's an ongoing battle. Um, and I'm positive I got it both times here in Western Canada. So you did, eh? So yeah, I'm corrected. Yeah. So like, don't take it lightly. And there is, uh, as you know, we make a spray ourselves up with our group of harvesters. And it's just some essential oils. The ticks don't like it. So Usually what happens, they'll drop on you from a branch or they come off the grass when you're walking through the grass. Yep. Then they'll climb up your pants and then they'll get in at your waistband or they'll continue right in. They'll get up over your collar, get you behind the ears, in the back of your neck. And um, so by having that spray on there, it uh, really deters them from crawling on you. They don't like it. It's a, it's a battle though. It's kind of like malaria. You never really ever get rid of it. 
but you uh, kind of keep the symptoms in check. The uh, Stats Canada says there's over 300,000 people in Canada that have have or had Lyme's disease. So really, eh? that's almost 10% of our population that they're admitting. It's like way worse than COVID, if that's yeah. possible. So, How long have you had it, Randy? Mm, I didn't know I had it the first time. So I didn't find, I was in Guatemala and I just had an ankle injury from picking that wasn't getting better. And I was like two or three years and I said, there's something wrong. So I went to a doctor there. They did tests and they said, well, you have Lyme's disease. And they, they said, we can treat the Lyme's here. But it comes, most Lyme, most of the ticks come with co-infections. So uh, they said, we, we don't, we're not really up on the co-infection. So they recommended I come home. But I ended up treating it homeopathically. And I tried both routes, the tried the mega antibiotics from the from our regular western medicine it didn't do a thing just made me messed up but if anybody's interested in what i use i did forward to burgess and saeed the uh, company that i use and i'll give you a quick example all summer i thought i had tore in my acl tendon in my right knee and I just was stubborn and I said, I'm just going to grind through it. So each step was agonizing. I'm, I have to make money to survive. You know, it's, this isn't a part-time gig for me. It's my full-time work. So you have to be productive. So you just kind of curse and cuss and force yourself through it. And then one day I got up at the end of the season, I'd had a couple of slow weeks to recover. And I jumped out of bed and that knee didn't hurt. And I went to take a step, it's in the other knee. And I said, wait a minute, that's not possible. I'm not crazy. So, and then it hit me, oh, limes. Because that's that's what happens with limes. You get uh, inflammation and it will randomly jump around your body. It could be your elbow one day, your ank, your wrist, your knee. You just don't know, right? So. And uh, I took that medicine. I happened to keep some on hand because it's not expensive. And within three days, I was like no pain in my knees. And it was like I was so thankful because it, it really was painful. If you've ever had a knee injury, it's it's not fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to stay mobile if you've got a knee injury. I can't imagine. You just got to you gotta grit and just, you know, uh, it, you talked on that a little bit before, Burgess, that, you know, we do this for a living. It's not, a, you know, it's not a weekend thing. No disrespect to people that go out and collect their stuff. But if you're doing it for a living, it's a different ball game. It's uh, so we try to be as professional as we can. So as, as much integrity and be as sustainable minded. And um it's hard because it's very competitive, but uh, you know, you just got to learn to walk away when things aren't going that it's, you know, not good. It's, some of the mushroom companies we deal against just uh, they'll send crews in there to pick every mushroom, the little babies, the rotten ones, every mushroom, they'll pick everything so that we don't get them. So when that kind of stuff happens, you just got to go, you just got to walk away. And so yeah. yeah it's it's crazy right like there's the thing there's there's all kinds of different products that are in the forest and a lot of people are after different things and it gets competitive yeah. sometimes so yeah i mean we're it, lucky it, in our space right now where there's not too many people doing what we do but obviously it, you know that's that's something over time that we'll find is not the case yeah. Burgess, not everybody can get out and do what we do. So we fill that void for those that can't. Yeah. And everybody deserves the right to have access to 
superfoods. And if we don't go out and do it, then a lot of people aren't going to have it. And yeah, absolutely. that's kind of how I look at it. I'm working for those that can't. Yeah. Well, and you also got passion. Like you do it because you love it as well, Randy. Like, oh yeah. I love the, that's my life in the forest. No, well, that's one thing you installed with us. Like, I mean, there's not much background, but Randy, Randy really helped us. Like, you know, we were very green when we started this, we had a passion for it. And we had a, we had a big, big curiosity about pine pollen and the benefits of it. And, you know, Randy came and he helped us kind of get going on this. And like he helped us implement a lot of the drying systems and whatnot we do. And so, you know, like there's, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot. Yep. There's a it lot was a learning process. <laughs> you you don't you don't really like realize you know, not knowing like how how much work it actually is until you actually get involved into it. So it's yeah, like I said it's, before, it's just long days are one thing, but being outside all day and the elements and um, yeah, you know it's 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 a hard go. So um, I, I kind of relate to, that to uh, like uh, prospecting for gold. When you're yeah. running the, the stuff through, through the sluice, you got to learn the different things that, you know, there's some stuff captures the big gold and there's other things that capture the little gold. So it's learning to combine all those things and, you know, to take the chance sometimes and just try stuff. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it was different for me because I'm used to drying mushrooms. I've drilled, literally dried over a million pounds of morel mushrooms. And, but morel mushrooms don't blow away in the wind when you're drying it. Yeah. Pollen does. So yeah. we couldn't use excessive amounts of wind, right? So. Oh, yeah. Remember the first year you got, we got, it was so hot. We got, you got sunstroke. <laughs> I did. I almost died. I know. Well, I and that's the thing. Like you were making, you were making fun of me because I was putting my, one of my t-shirts are off my, around my head, like a turban. So I was covered yeah. up. And I think as the only one of the only guys that actually didn't get some stroke. But, but anyway, you know, what it, a hot it, summer that was. Oh my God. No, that was brutal. I just, you know what it was? I was, it was so hot. It was like 40 degrees or something that day. And we're in a tent on the sun baked hill. And I'm used to just when I work, that's how I've always been. I go 120%. Right. So, I'm in that thing and I'm getting hotter and hotter, but I just want to get that next little, uh, I think we were sifting out some pine pollen that we'd already tried and we needed to run yeah, it through that. It was, and so I'm just working. giving her, right? Yeah. I'm just giving her. And the next thing I know, I'm getting wobbly and I, I walked to my tent and I didn't quite make it. I just collapsed on the ground and thankfully Saeed seen me. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I was heat sensitive for three or four years after that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Had to be really careful. Yeah. It's a hard job. Yeah, it's it's really hard. It's labor intensive. Anybody that yeah. gets out there, I mean, it's not easy. It's It takes a nope. special person and a lot of determination to be able to continue through the whole season of picking that. So it's, yeah. it's you know, it's, it's not something that, um, you know, I invite and that's, you know, I invite people to come out and. Yep. try it at home as well and it's not a thing where it's like it's i think you appreciate it more once you understand the work involved of what it takes to actually get the product and also if you're consuming this product and you go out and try it yourself i think you just find more value in the product as well because you realize you know you're putting your labor of love into it in order to enjoy and experience this thing you absolutely yourself Pollen doesn't come from the store. It comes from trees. And yeah. somebody's got to go do that. It's the same as a lot of people now. They take for granted where our, where our food comes from. Right? It's just, they just think, oh, it comes at the store. Well, there's a lot between getting it, raising it, and getting it processed and safely and then to the store. It's a big, it's a lot going on. Yeah. yeah it's a challenge for sure it is and i mean yeah. but it is super it's rewarding it is like rewarding. it is it is it's good it's always you always got that feeling at the end of the day i mean there's there's something to be said for just hard physical work and you know there's something 
that's always really satisfying at the end of the day or even at the end of the harvest a sense of accomplishment yep. you know it's, it's it is it truly easy. is you put it's, your love into it and your yeah. soul and... it's um it takes a lot yeah so andrea i hope you can come up and see one time you know you're always yeah I, w I would love to i would really love to and um one thing that i've noticed immediately upon my first product experience is the the, the immense um integrous and whole food vibration of of the of the tinctures of what's in the tincture and um for me it i felt this way beyond just the actual pollen in there but I did feel everything that went into actually creating this pollen, which is the environment, the seasons, the tree and everything the tree's been through. And then when you mentioned just now that um, you prefer to pick the ones that are readily willing to give up the pollen, that makes so much sense because then you're in harmony with the tree and the tree saying here, let me give you this. And you're saying, thank you. I want to take this. Oh, you know, yeah. there's so much integrity and so much love and mutual respect. Where else on this planet do you find that these days with something you can ingest, you know? What a powerful expression. It's true that the tree was right. giving it up. The tree is giving it to you. So yeah, like, yeah, you're, yeah. you're accepting as it a gift. You're not taking it from it. It's, it's, it's lending yeah, it. Yeah, you're out. not foraging it but you are yeah you're right with reverence. You're, you're accepting it with reverence yeah and the people that are successful are the people that actually resonate and speak to the trees because you know they're, they're giving uh, it to them you know what i mean yeah. those are the people that are making yeah, you know yeah. good progress so mm -hmm. absolutely yeah, yeah you sure. are you are what you create and as harvest not all harvesters like there's like anything else in life there's all kinds of people that harvest, but there's many of us that have been doing this a long time. We're really in tune with nature and the forest, and we don't look at the trees necessarily as a separate entity. We're part of the trees. We're part of that system, and that's very true what you said. It's, uh, we put a lot of love and positive energy, and that's how we motivate ourselves to go above and beyond, you know, it's like, it's really easy to give up after one bucket of pollen, fine, of the cones. Yeah. Because it's hot, you're sweating, you're, you know, you're grinding it out and, you know, it takes a lot. And um, well, though, sometimes I'll come in and check on people in specific areas. And you can tell the people that are really like, they, the people that are good at it really love it because, you know, they're, when they're doing it, they're doing their thing, but they're just about dancing when they do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're yeah. so happy yeah. and they get in the zone and they're just like, you know what I mean? They're dancing with the trees, it looks like. You know what yeah. I mean? Like some of them might be listening to music and whatnot, but a lot of them are just listening to the wind and, you know, enjoying like their surroundings and also like, yeah, just being part of it. Like, I feel like it's a meditative experience just being with the forest and just enjoying that opportunity to be outside especially at that that's such a magical time of the year like it's it, it's it's the year it's the part of the year where it's kind of giving birth to the rest of the summer like you know like that pollen is basically getting out there and starting like i said before it's it's releasing all of its kind of nutritional goodness to the rest of the forest at that time it's it's really the change of seasons it's the start of yep. the summer spring and whatnot so it is a it's, magic it's, time to be in the forest it's yeah. it is it truly is and it's the um the promise of spring and it's the same with us with morel mushrooms it's one of the first things that grow yeah in the spring and uh, it is very much the same in that in the spiritual aspect of it because you know you're just you're you're focused on that everything else all the problems in the world disappear you're at one with nature yeah and it, it's uh there's one other thing too that it's like being on an easter egg hunt yeah, yeah. You, you're just 
you're that's just from like, our own. I mean, from my fall, you get to an but, area. Well, Paul, and if you find the tree, though, it is, right? When you find well, that. Well, yeah, you're tree, right. There's good it. trees. Yeah, you'll find a tree you can spend a good few hours at if you find Yeah, and you're just yeah. like, oh, look at this tree, right? Just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true, too. Yeah. yeah. So. That's what makes it fun. It does. It does. It does. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you can get to an area where you know you're making good, good production, that definitely yeah. makes things easier and that's generally when you see people dancing with the trees <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're dancing when they bring the uh, the fault cones in at the end of the day yeah yeah that's true too how many like, pounds uh, did i get huh? yeah yeah how many pounds yeah. how many pounds? well Randy, guys like, i'd love how, to continue. how, how, how doing, long Maria? have you been um working with canadian pine pollen since the beginning when they started so 2016 yeah, yeah. and I've been doing this foraging as partially for, oh, since the mid eighties. Wow. So yeah, I'm one of the grandfathers now, unfortunately. Well, what about, <laughs> talk about your YouTube videos, Randy. Yeah. So anybody that's interested, we have a YouTube channel. It's called Northern Wild Harvest. And we wanted to teach people how to, do things sustainably in a much more respectable professional attitude. So we realized that we couldn't tell people that. So the only way we could figure it out was to do it by example. So we take people along and right now we're in uh, the middle of uh, our morel season from last year. So, you know, we've gotten really good with drones and, uh, my youngest son is just turning into an awesome narrator. So the, it's it's quite popular. And we do a number of products. And um, so we have a Shopify site. We didn't want to be subjected to some of the big companies that they just don't care about the environment. Yeah. And professionally, I won't say their names, but, you know, it's, typical big corporations that have kind of it's all about money and to them so well, yeah they probably have prior commitments they got quotas and they got to get it no matter what yeah exactly and i don't take on their stuff i just do oh. what i know is what we do and yeah. um what so is the, it, the channel it's northern wild harvest oh thank you yeah, yeah. So listen, guys, I got to get going here, but um, Randy, let's get you on another time, okay? Because Yeah, uh, well, I got this sorted out now, and uh, it was so, getting frustrating. I kept trying. It says, well, they're in another meeting, and I'm like, no, well, I was talking you up the whole time, hoping to get on with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> People weren't sure if you existed, but anyway, <laughs> we still got through it. I was kind of mumbling along there about harvest so uh it's good yeah. but I mean, it's always nice to have somebody to kind of go back and forth with on it so we'll it's, get you back uh, you know i just i still have those photos from the first year when we were at singing lands here yeah when that'd be really cool there. maybe if we do it we can share those with maria so then maybe we can have some photos in the background right be a really cool it's, it's kind of interesting to see them all laid out and it's in its own it's you know it's part of the deal right and it's just not opening your bottle of tincture. There's a lot of love and work and energy that goes into that. And honestly, Burgess, that's what separates us from everybody else is when you can show what you're putting into it. Yeah. It's, yeah, of uh, course. I mean, that's, it's, it's, again, it's easy, it's easy to just, I'm not trying to like, I don't want to bad, all I know is our product. And like, yep. I feel really good about the fact that what's in our product is is yep. exactly what we say is in our product and that's all that's in our product it's there's no yep. there's no funny business there it's it's basically exactly what it is and it's supposed to be and it's it, tough. It, yeah. in a world where people are trying to cut corners and trying to like say mm. you know and i mean at the end of the day i, I mean again we yep. wouldn't be in business if people didn't if they weren't repeat customers there's just no way we'd still be able right. to keep doing what we're doing so I mean, it's, so it's good. It's people like Andrea. Thank you so much. And yeah, just hearing you speak too. It's just it's so good to hear like some of the expressions and some yeah. of the ways you have of putting things together and even just bringing to our attention is a lot of times, like we're so caught up in sometimes it's easy, easy to just get 
I love these communications and talking to people because it just kind of grounds you. You know what I mean? It just kind of puts things in perspective and understand why you're doing this every day and you know things get oh busy. yes 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 so I, nice i'm very uh i'm quite sensitive and intuitive so um i could tell right away uh what i picked up on was the vibration not just of the product but also of the love and integrity that went into it um yeah. that's another aspect of of what's in this bottle <laughs> and the very first time when i when i got ready to take it I would put it on my chest and I would say a prayer for everybody who brought this to me every right. freaking body including the postal service <laughs> yeah. and just so say sweet. thank you you know and 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 I still do that I still do that as a little ritual that I give thanks and I breathe with that and I I allow and I welcome all that goodness and that energy to 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 love me and to 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 heal and benefit my cells and my spirit and my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 It, it, it really is. A, I'm, a, I'm 70 this month. So oh, wow. climbing up the hills and packing heavy packs is not easy. Yeah. And, You're but what I'm finding at this stage of my life, I'm way more spiritual now. The energy that mm, I realized that we are what we put out. So yeah. if, if you think yeah. this, that's what's going to happen. If you think negative, well, guess what? It's going to be negative. So it's, and, and then, so on that aspect, in into what you had said is it's so true because so many of us put so much, we put our lives into this, you know, it's like yeah. everything, everything. Like there's few people that can do what we do. They just couldn't handle palatable. it. Palatable. It's really palatable. This was yeah. not done by a by a combine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. By a Midwestern yeah. combine, for yeah. sure not. <laughs> there, there's no no such thing as an easy harvest. So, you know, it's uh, yeah, every, but every it is a beautiful thing. Challenges. It's beautiful. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Much. Thank you for all you do. Oh, thank, you, Andrea, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, you for keeping us able to do what we want to do too. So, and thanks for being part of these conversations. I can't tell you how much it means to me to see your face every time you pop up. Oh, really? It, really it is. It's such a compliment that you're, you're interested in being part of this. And absolutely, yeah, like, it's yeah. so nice to see you and John each time that I'm on here. Yeah. It's just yeah. so comforting. Like, I don't care if anybody else is watching. I just enjoy having a conversation. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, party. vice versa. I feel the same. Absolutely. Yeah. It's nice I to see a face from Maria too, because I think yeah. that's <laughs> I've only gotten to email Randy. You're a yeah. legend around here. Uh oh. <laughs> I hope it's all good. I, no, I try to make it good. Let's do this, Randy. Let's let's get you on again and maybe try to get Philip on with you. And then maybe we can right. do just like, you know, some more about about um you can bring those pictures on of the early harvest days and then we can have a better explanation for everybody. Yeah, and also like, to, uh, like we can talk about the morels because we get all our morels from Randy. So you guys can see exactly where the morels come from too. So that's cool, pretty cool. cool. Yes. So yeah, I mean, and, and, another and a lot of the other products that like, there's so much out there that we could take advantage of it, but it all comes down to being able to afford to do it because even though you have a good product that people are going to want, well, you still have to a million, it. Yeah, you're right, Randy. There's a million things out there, but I mean, it has to be something that people are interested in. And generally, in order for people to get interested, you have to educate them. And it's yep. just, you know, it's you just can't show up with some exactly. exotic root from the forest that you know is good for you, but nobody's heard about it before. I think it would sit on a shelf. You know what I mean? Like, well, and then there's just so much distrust too. So right. that's the there's other reason. That too, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. You have to build that relationship and there has to be, and I think that transparency of showing people exactly what it is and, and having these conversations and yeah, Andrea, it's great that you're actually like so curious about the harvest and I'm starting to understand more and more why now is because it's true. Uh, people want to see exactly what's involved and where it's coming from and why it's coming from and, and exactly what they're consuming and where it is. So, um, yeah. You know that it's such a powerful thing, and I think that's something maybe we should be focusing more attention on is making sure people understand. You know, really, that's what separates us from anybody else is 
we have the ability to share the harvest and the story that you know this is being yep. well harvested in a really special area of the world so. and then how much is out there because people are thinking well you're taking all the food and it's like well we're not yeah. even yeah we've had of, of all the pollen too. that's out there fine pollen that's out there we're like point zero 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 one percent of a one percent no know? yeah we're a billionth of what there is yes yeah, exactly. ridiculous to think what it is but you know it's yeah. true like i mean people are probably obviously <clears throat> not just not educated you know like these people just i think they don't understand if they think we're going into the forest with a bulldozer and just you know taking taking trees down in order to get our product you know if they're not educated on why that's not the case then i can understand why there would be trust but you know but, well the concern is is valid but the reality is like it's really redundant because the little we could take a million times more than we are and it still wouldn't even affect anything no nope, it's true it's true but you know what we gotta we gotta purvey that we gotta we gotta show yeah. that message and explain it to people in a way that everybody understands is, that's is why we do the youtube because and hopefully this year we can get in a little bit of time before morels and we can get some uh pollen you know catkin picking in and then kind of show that too you know so yeah for sure we'll, i we'll think try. an extensive a more all-encompassing um video storytelling um mm. i think could be very beneficial um, watch any of the videos where it's on more, site, Andrea? what's that have you seen any of the videos on oh, our yes site yes i okay. have yeah, yeah yeah but to 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 take that information and how the harvest works and why you're doing what you're doing and all that hard work and love that goes into it and then just have create one video that might even be much longer than a regular <clears throat> sales video and so that people have a better understanding yeah now that's a really good point you, know, you gotta yeah. really uh, dissect it instead of yeah outside of the marketing side right, right? Mm -hmm. okay well that's good yeah that's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So more education and so that yep. people who are interested can really dive in there and, and feel into it. Something that people can feel into if they choose to. Yeah. Kind of yeah. like a, a docu-series or... Like yeah, a yeah. Instead of the rah, 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 co commonplace rah, rah, rah. And, get uh, some GoPros and have people like, you know, cameras on their head watching them pick for a bit. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> you got to be out there with the drone burgess while they're picking, following oh, them. Around. We need a drone. Things Randy. to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> we need You're your son to come out. <laughs> hey guys, I got to cut this short here. All right, um, thanks. Let's go ahead thanks, and everyone. follow up with Randy on Good another job. call. Andrea, look forward to seeing you next week. I will I'm not be sure here. What's the conversation, uh, but we'll figure something out. Okay. <laughs> thanks for still getting here, Randy. I appreciate well, it, even though it was sorry late. it took me so long. It was a little frustrating, but hey, we did it. Well, thanks, wasn't your Randy. Fault. We'll just get this thing going. Okay. Thanks, Maria, for setting yeah, this up. You're welcome.